Well, welcome everybody. Glad you could join us this evening. Uh, my name is Stephanie Couch. I'm the executive director of the Lemelson MIT program, and uh, we're very excited about our guest speakers we have for you tonight. Um, our first speaker is Nicole Morris, a faculty member at Emory University School of Law in Atlanta, Georgia, a professor of practice and director of the TIGER program, which stands for Technological Innovation Generating Economic Results, and that's in partnership with Georgia Tech. Um, this program brings together graduate students in law, business, science, and engineering to take ideas from lab to the marketplace. As a professor in practice, her areas of expertise include patent law, patent litigation, patent protection, and prosecution, IP licensing, and strategy. And we also have with us tonight, Lewis Foreman, who's CEO of product development from Inventus and adjunct professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at Queens University of Charlotte. And he's also publisher of Inventors Digest magazine and producer of the award-winning TV show, Everyday Edison's. So Lewis is season, a seasoned inventor himself with 12 registered US patents and has overseen the development, filing and commercialization of over 700 more innovations. So I'm gonna let each of them share a little bit more about themselves, but um, one of the reasons why we're really excited about having the two of them is that we know there are lots of people out there, um, including our teachers and our K-12 students and, and college faculty and college students, but a lot of great ideas. They do very creative work, uh, come up with very creative solutions to uh, problems that people face. And, you know, it's okay to commercialize and to get some value back from that. Um, it's not a bad thing. And so we're excited to be able to share how you can do that, um, or even uh, any other type of creative work that's produced. So a lot of times these are um, mystery areas. We don't all know how to do this. So we're excited to share that information uh, with everyone tonight. So um, Nicole, can, can you say a little bit more about yourself? What did I leave out? Um, no, that was a wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is healthy and safe. I am a chemical engineer and I worked as an engineer for about six years before I went and switched over to uh, legal practice and, and legal work. So it's helpful to understand both sides, I think, um, in terms of what it takes to create and uh, focus on technology as a source of inventions. And then I worked as a patent attorney before I became a professor. So I've filed many patent applications. So. Delighted to take questions, delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Wow, that is just so impressive. You know, I used to play racquetball and I played with this guy and he could play with the racket in his left or his right hand. And whenever I hear someone like you where you have chemistry and you have a law degree, I, I always think about that analogy because it's like, wow, you have it all. So congratulations. No, I don't have it all. If I had it all, I would be on a boat in some far, far away land, unable to connect to the internet, but I am I'm working <laughs> through that. There you go, my, my ancestors' home, home uh, island of Pico. Uh, okay, uh, Luis Foreman, uh, tell us a little bit more. What did I miss? Great, thanks, Stephanie, and it's uh, it is definitely a pleasure to be with all of you this evening. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started my first business in my fraternity room in college 33 years ago, and I've been starting companies ever since. Uh, I have a real passion for both innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, the company that I own, Inventus, is a product design firm, and we've helped develop and launch over 2,000 consumer products and medical devices over the last 19 years. Uh, and then I also believe strongly in a strong IP system. And so I serve on the IPO and the IPO EF Foundation. Um, I served seven years on the Patent Office Public Patent Advisory Committee. Uh, and uh, I just um, 
am always looking to help, you know, educate people on, on not only the process of entrepreneurship, but also the ways that you leverage intellectual property to be successful. Great. Well, th thank you also for being here and for caring about um, educating everyone uh, on how to do this important work. We have been uh, partnering the Lumelson MIT program with the Michelson Foundation. And I'm pleased that Jelani Odlum is here uh, and she is gonna take it away. So Jelani, over to you. Okay, that sounds great. And hi, Lewis and Nicole, great to see you both. Um, thank you everyone who submitted questions beforehand as well. And just to let you know, we have a raffle going on. So um, stay on the line until the end and we'll be announcing our raffle winners. We have three Visa gift cards, three $15 Visa gift cards that are up for grabs. So um, continue to, to um, you know, just put your questions in the chat box and um, stay engaged. And we will announce those winners at the end of the session here. Uh, so I am going to get us started and just start pitching questions over to Nicole and Lewis. Um, and also please feel free to keep um, uh, putting your questions in the either the Q&A or the chat box um, works well. So the first one up here is, does the invention have to work or can it be a concept in order to be patented? You want me to start? Yeah, uh, why don't you start, Nicole? So the sad news is um, technically yes. And, and maybe it's sad for someone, maybe it's not. Um, for an invention to be patentable, you have to show more than just the conception of the idea. So you have to show that um, you're solving a problem. And in order for you to show that you're solving the problem, you wanna to demonstrate to the patent office that you've tested it, that you might have a prototype um, and it works um, to some extent because you wanna capture those features in your patent application. So whatever you have discovered in terms of the solution to the problem, you wanna capture that in your patent application. So it's clear that you are a true inventor. So that's why it, it's a little bit more than just, I came up with this great idea and it's really just on paper, but you've never really proven it out beyond that. Yeah, you know, in the early years of the patent system, you actually had to submit a working prototype with your invention. And uh, the, the patent office used to have to store all those functional prototypes, which you can imagine took up a lot of space. Uh, but today you just have to be able to describe in detail the usefulness of the invention to be able to show that it actually does function. So time travel, as novel as it may seem, uh, would not be patentable because of that reason. Okay, that leads us well into this um, next question because I think novelty is something we you, you might want to talk about here. But how unique does your invention have to be um, to consider whether you should patent it? Yeah, well, I'm, the, the, the first criteria for a patent uh, is it's got to be novel uh, and non-obvious and meaning that it has to exist. And so you've got to go out there and make sure that the patent or, or the invention that you've created uh, doesn't exist in any form, not just in the United States, but anywhere in the world. That's right. Um, there are really three requirements and novelty is the first big one. Um, so new and useful to the world, non-obviousness, which is really a heavy legal concept, but it gets at this uniqueness. Is it different enough from what we already understand and know? Um, and then there's some formality requirements in terms of the disclosure itself, like what you write out in the patent application must satisfy some formal requirements. So uniqueness is important. Awesome. Uh, a question that I really like here is where do you go to apply for a patent? Um, and I would follow that up by saying is, you know, USPTO.gov a good first step or actually would you recommend a, another first step maybe? Nope, the patent office website is literally the best place to start. Um, the, the website is actually better today, or at least over the last four years, than say like 10, 12, 15 years ago. It was really unuser friendly, but today um, there's lots of helpful resources. And um, 
I know there might be some thoughts about global filing in this uh, in this group, but it's a really good place to start, particularly if you want to file a patent application outside the US. Yeah, and I would just add that the USPTO website is just a tremendous resource for independent inventors. They, they have really done an exceptional job to make information easy to obtain, uh, to educate first-time inventors about the process of filing a patent, uh, and then also searching for prior art. A question that we have here that I think feeds well to this early, um, these kind of early stage questions are, can you tell us, or what can you tell us about keeping an inventor's journal? I'm going to let you take that one, Lewis. Yeah, so a lot of that changed. Um, you know, back in the day, and, and this was just, well, eight years ago, seven years ago, um, when it was first to invent versus first to file, having an inventor's notebook was important to show the date of invention. And so if two inventors were to come up with the same idea and both were to file, that inventor's notebook could serve as a uh, proof of who actually invented the invention first. And so you would file an interference uh, proceeding to be able to show that you, you know, filed or that you invented before someone else. That's all changed now with first to file. And so now it's the first person to arrive uh, is, you know, the first inventor to arrive and file a patent uh, is entitled to the patent. Okay, next up. Um, how do you know what type of patent your invention falls under? How would you decide um, a utility patent versus a design patent if the design feature has utility? So, very good question. Um, utility patents and design patents um, function um, uniquely but separately. They're very distinct doctrines. So, utility is mostly any technical or um, usefulness requirement where it's, think of it as a problem solution kind of thing. You've addressed a, um, pro you've discovered a solution to a problem and you wanna put that forth in a utility application. And the utility application could include a device. So it could be a machine, it could be a process, it could be a method of manufacture. So you have a lot of different um, ways you can categorize your invention under utility filing. Design rights are meant to aesthetically protect something. So I used to work for Coca-Cola. And if you can think of the Coca-Cola bottle, think of the Sprite bottle, there's some distinct design features and the aesthetics of the design is what you wanna capture. You cannot get functionality rights through design patents. So if, you're, if your bottle um, is designed in a certain way because it lets liquid flow better, then you should file a utility patent because you want to describe all those fluid dynamics in the utility filing. But if it's just a really cool shape and it could probably not function well to drink out of, but you want to protect it because it's so cool, that's what you want to do with the design. So the design is very much, think of it as taking a picture and saying all of these features I will protect in a design patent filing and everything else about the functionality, the technical benefits and all that stuff, I will file simultaneously in a utility patent application. And, and I would just add that it's not either or, right? You can do both. And so it, it's better to actually have more protection in this case than less. So a design patent is gonna protect the ornamental appearance of the invention. Uh, so when you think about the early versions of the iPhone, Apple was very smart to actually file design patents on that iconic design. You know, the rectangular uh, device with a round circle, a round button at the very bottom to, you know, get to the home screen. Uh, and, and ultimately they were successful in, you know, suing Samsung for design patent infringement because they literally knocked off, you know, the same looking type device. So you don't have to look at it as, okay, do I file a design patent or a utility patent. A utility patent is going to protect how the device functions, whereas the design patent is going to protect the way it looks. And for some reason, every time I talk, my screen freezes. And so I'm not sure what the problem is, but sorry. 
Okay, well, we can hear you loud and clear. So you're coming across. Um, I'll move on to this question. When's the right moment in product evolution to make use of a provisional patent? And then maybe um, Nicole and Lewis, if you could walk us through the utility and strategy behind filing for a provisional patent. Um, and then we have sort of a follow-up question. Um, does first to file include provisional patent applications? So provisionals. So, so picking up on um, what we talked about earlier about the first to file versus first to invent, it, it made filing a provisional even more important in the sense that if you file a provisional application, it gives you a year, the application's never examined, it never becomes a patent, but it buys you a year where you can go out and test the market, refine your idea, determine if you really want to take the next step and file a utility application. And then when you do file that utility application, you go back to the original date of your provisional application. So that may actually help you in terms of first to file. So if you have a provisional application filed before someone files a utility application on a similar invention, as long as you move forward with your utility application, you're going to go back to that earlier date of filing. Yeah, no, that was, that was perfect. Um, provisionals protect you from any public disclosure. So in terms of the timeline and where in that, um, where in that innovation process you should file a provisional. Um, if you feel like you're you're going to risk um, any public disclosure, if you, you know, I work in the university setting, so we file lots of provisionals for our university researchers because they're going to publish something, right? So we want to get that filing date um, in the system so they can go out and talk about their work. Um, but likewise for you know, just inventors outside of the university system, you might have a product demo meeting. Um, you might think about marketing materials, depending on where you are in your commercialization timeline. So getting a provisional is super helpful just to sort of know, the public knows you're serious if you're talking about this is patent pending. Um, it might help you get funding. There's lots of like other mechanisms that then uh, feed off of the notion that you actually have a provisional patent application on file. And it also gives you a little comfort when you're potentially talking with licensees. You can you know, legally say that you're patent pending at this point. Uh, and so when you're kind of dipping your toe in the water to determine whether or not it makes sense to move forward, that provisional buys you that year to, to be able to be patent pending uh, and determine whether or not you want to move forward. I feel like we have a really sophisticated group. So I'll just add one other caveat. Um, be mindful of your timeline. So the clock starts with that provisional filing and the timeline you wanna be mindful of is global filing. So you follow up a year after your provisional and you're like, I'm gonna go with a full fledged, full patent application in the United States. Well, any foreign applications that you might want any global filings you might want to consider will start from that provisional date. So you may need to think about stuff within that one year filing of the provisional if you want to file globally as well. So just a timeline sort of asterisk to put in your in your notation just to make sure if you think, oh, and I want to protect this in France. Well, you've got to get your act together a year after your provisional. Okay, and a follow up here. Um, will an expired provisional aid in first to file disputes? So the answer is maybe depending on the nature of the dispute. So a provisional application is never reviewed by the patent office. So it's really just kind of a timestamp. It's like, yep, we're going to note that on uh, November 12th, 2020, you claim a right to this invention. If you do nothing with it and you let it expire November 12th, 2021, it's like dead to the office. So if there is any future filings, um, you're like starting all over. Now, if there's some way you can claim priority back to this provisional, you do something before it expires. You file a PCT, which is a Paris Treaty um, convention treaty application for global stuff. You file the non-provisional and you kind of keep it going. You file another provisional, right? 
You can also file serial provisionals. They'll have their own priority date, but you can just file a new provisional application. Um, but if you just let it die, there's really nothing that you can sort of claim to it because it's never examined, it's not published. So it doesn't become um, a public document that you can cite to. It's really an internal mechanism within the patent office in the US. That's why she went to law school. <laughs> Great, that was super helpful. Um, thank you both. This gets complicated really quickly, but I feel like we've got the nerdy nerds in this chat in this session today, so we can pull out all our all our tools. Yeah, seems like we have a good mix um, in the audience today. Okay, questions that we get every day: How much does it cost to file for a patent, and what is the cost of a provisional? Good question. Literally was looking that up before I came and, and I didn't see all the new numbers because the filing fees went up recently. Yeah. So yeah, Lewis, if you've got new numbers, I'll let you go. I was just gonna say yeah, I've got relatively new... relatively new numbers. And and I'm assuming my screen is frozen up again, right? Okay. <laughs> yes, I, I have no idea why I, when I speak my screen freezes up, but I will uh, I will go through this with you. You, you know, one of the great bargains that the US Patent Office offers to independent inventors are discounts, believe it or not. So if you're an independent inventor and you haven't filed many patents, you get a small entity discount. And more importantly, if you're a really small inventor, there's a micro entity fee that's 50% less than that dollar amount. So there are a number of fees associated with filing a patent. You know, there is the application fee, there's the, um, the search fee, and then there's the examination fee. So they break these three fees down. But basically, to file a patent as a regular inventor, it's about uh, $900 for a utility application and $450 if you're a micro entity, so 50% less. The, the real big difference between you know that $900 and what most people pay for a patent, which is you know five to ten thousand dollars, are the attorney fees. But you've got to understand that an attorney is skilled in filing patents. They will get you broader claims. They will work really hard to construct a patent that may ultimately be the most valuable asset you ever own in your life. And, and certainly, you don't have to look very far but Gary Michelson to see what the value of a strong IP portfolio it could be worth if done properly. So the actual fees you pay to the government are small, but you should just understand that if you're gonna file a patent, you're probably gonna spend somewhere between five and $10,000 for a utility application. So guys, I have to jump in here. And if you had someone who just didn't have the money, but they think they have a really great idea, where can they go for some pro bono services? Are there any resources out there? There are lots of resources. So that's the good news. Um, there are two main resources for the public. One, there are law schools that are actually working with inventors if you meet sort of the pro bono threshold for legal services, that you can get a law student and a practicing attorney working together to help you file your patent application, that's one. Two, the patent office has started a pro bono patents program and it's regional. So I know we have a huge one in the Metro Atlanta area and we actually take inventors all across the state. Um, and we also work with North Carolina inventors, we work with Alabama inventors, so I think the way the coverage is so far with the US patent pro bono program, all 50 states are covered. So it's just a matter of kind of Googling US patent pro bono and figuring out where in your jurisdiction um, the pro bono services are. The only hiccup is again, you must meet that sort of pro bono legal services threshold, um, meaning that you really can't afford to hire a lawyer. Um, one thing that we do here in Georgia with our pro bono program, if you don't meet the threshold financially to qualify, like you're not poor enough, so to speak, um, we have attorneys that we refer to that the firm will sort of put you in their pro bono bucket, which is a higher threshold than the government pro bono bucket. So you can still get a discount um, versus a giant corporation 
in terms of what they might pay for legal services. Um, but it, you know, to Lewis's point, the patent is so valuable, particularly if you're competing in the marketplace um, with a product that either you want to save up, try to figure out a way to, to find financial resources to support it. Um, there's lots of competition, especially if you're a student where you can win some prize money um, and use that prize money towards the patent application. Maybe you can get an early investor if your idea is really novel and just revolutionary and transformative who believes in you and what you're trying to do. And that person will help fund some of this early stage um, IP protection. So I don't want anyone to be discouraged if you like look in your bank account and you're like, according to my records, I can't afford that. Um, there are ways that you can get that done. Okay, and I'll, and I'll tag on to that one. Um, how can someone defend their patent from infringement if they don't have a lot of money? Yeah, so that's the flip side. <laughs> um, the good news there, and I, there, there used to be many firms, I think there's still several, but um, not as many as before. Uh, there are firms, law firms that will take your case pro bono or what we call contingency fee, which gets a bad reputation because sometimes people sort of um, are not uh, fair about the fees later on. But basically that says upfront, you pay no money. It's like a no money down legal sort of attorney client relationship. If they win the case for you though, they're likely to take upwards of 40 to, I've heard as high as 50, 50 is high. 40 should be the ceiling, but 40% of the recovery. So you sue Apple, you win a uh, million dollars and the law firm arrangement with you is they get 40%. So they're gonna get 600,000. Um, and you will 400,000, excuse me, you're gonna get 600,000. So that's kind of how that split works. A lot of people get upset about contingency fee arrangements, but they forget they're not paying legal fees for the entire time of the lawsuit. So the way it's kind of like a bet on um, recovery and the, the firms are trying to be efficient about how they manage the case so they can get the recovery and you as a client, you're not worried about legal bills. Yeah, and litigation is expensive. Um, if you ask any inventor who has gone through the entire litigation process all the way to a verdict, you're talking about millions of dollars uh, to see that through. And so, you know, working with a contingency firm uh, and paying them on the back end certainly manages the risk profile. Uh, obviously, you know, the uncertainty on the strength of patents has caused a lot of problems. Um, when, when you could just go into court with a patent and a patent was assumed to be valid, there was, there was greater certainty on what the outcome would be. But you know, today, the changing tides have kind of stripped away some of the value of intellectual property. And that's what's unfortunate. Uh, and I'll, I'll have another one I will pitch to you, Lewis. Um, have you seen any success with applications prepared by the inventor, or do you think it's always best to work with a professional? Yeah, you know, I, I do know of some inventors who have done pro se, so doing it themselves, applications. Um, I don't know that they necessarily got as strong a patent as they may have gotten with working with a professional. Um, I know a lot of great doctors, they would never operate on themselves. And so you, you've got to be really careful. And, you know, the property rights that are defined by a patent are much like property rights, you know, that you think about like owning a piece of land. And if you don't properly stake out what you believe is yours and what you're entitled to, and maybe you do it more narrowly than what you should have done you end up getting less than what you're legally entitled to as a property right in a patent. And that's what attorneys are skilled at being able to do. They're able to look at you know, the invention and define the scope and claims of that patent to give the inventor the maximum value that they're entitled to. Awesome, and I have a claims question that we'll follow this up with. Um, any advice on how to differentiate my patent claims from similar products that are out there? It's all about the features, right? So um, you wanna make sure 
that whatever your unique features, like whatever, you should really start with the value proposition. Like what value does your product bring? You define the features of that value and you put that in your claim. So if your innovation um, is similar to something that's on the market, but you can clearly distinguish and differentiate, um, our camera can move 360 degrees. The next competitors is only 180, right? Like you wanna put the 360 in your claim scope. Um, you know, you can get uh, pretty detailed with your claims. So whatever you think is really the value that the consumer will either switch or that you bring in terms of a price differentiation, um, all of that should be captured in the claims. Okay. Great. I have a few software questions that we will try to tag together. One is um, how can you patent an app or can you patent an app? Um, and then also what kinds of software features or designs are patentable and just overall how are software patents handled? Yeah, software is like, software is like the child that you know sometimes acts out in public, but you just cross your fingers and you're like, I hope this child won't embarrass me today. That's software patents right now. It's kind of all over the place. Um, from about 2014 to about 2018, it was like dead, like software patents were dead. We had a Supreme Court decision. Um, people were confused in terms of what they could file for. I think software patents are on the rise again. Um, and not, I know that they're on the rise again but their scope of protection is pretty specific and limited. So I generally, I generally, I'm not a fan of software patents, put it this way. Um, unless you know, unless you're Oracle, right? Like your business has to be, I'm so good at software that I'm filing these patent applications and I'm competing, I'm Microsoft, I'm Oracle, like I'm that deep. Um, if you're, I dip my toe in to software, but I have some really unique features outside of software. Keep your software a trade secret. You know, no one knows how the Google search engine works, right? They've not filed a single patent on their search engine. Yeah. They're wildly successful on their search engine, right? For that reason. So one of the, um, it's not in the Q and A so far, but I think it's helpful at this point. Um, to explain when you file a patent application, think of it as a recipe that you're making, like grandma's secret cookie rep recipe. You've got to tell them how much flour, how much eggs, how much water. And more importantly, if you know like the real secret to keeping it soft and moist is you bake it like for only 13 minutes, you got to tell that in the patent application. So if you don't want to give away all of your unique know-how and and how this product really will perform the best, don't file a patent application. Um, now, if it's super easy to reverse engineer your software, perhaps you do want to file a patent application because you, at least you want to make it publicly known you were the first in the world to, to do this. Um, but if you've got some protection, either in reverse engineering or it's really simple and if you give it away, then 20 years are up and then it's, it's done. Um, software is, is tricky from that perspective. And the last thing I'll say is, it's easy to design around, right? It's software, it's code. You write some more code, suddenly, you know, it could be argued that it's not the same. And we'll learn a lot um, from this Google Oracle case on what's protectable and what's fair use and what's all this other stuff and copyright. So. I would push you to the copyright world for software, but I don't know what's gonna happen with that. So like software is a moving target that's hard for attorneys to give like real assurances to clients because it's like, oh, don't patent it, file a copyright. And I know there's a whole like string of stuff happening in copyright for software right now. I'm like, just pause, just kind of chill out and let the law settle itself a little bit. Yeah, yeah and sure I, would, I would also something. add that, you know, we're talking a lot about patents, but there's other forms of intellectual property that can help you if you're designing an app. Uh, one of them obviously is a trademark. So, you know, when you look at popular apps like Instagram or TikTok, they've got a brand that people recognize. Uh, and then being first to market, you know, the first mover advantage can be huge. And so if you get that first mover advantage, if you've got 
a trademark that protects your brand, maybe some copyright around the code, or to Nicole's point, some trade secrets uh, that you don't share about how you do what you do, the algorithm that you've created to make all of this work, that gives you a huge advantage as well, even if you're not able to get a patent on it. Mm -hmm. Great. And I'm going to actually move us to some non-patent questions, but we'll come back to patents. So um, this question is, how do I copyright protect software I build for someone? So maybe if you can speak to um, the, the copyrightability of software, and then also this is sort of getting into a work for hire scenario. So. Yeah, I was just about to say, it's a work for hire. You definitely want to put it in place. You know, copyright law doctrinally is actually a great doctrine because it protects the creator. Like it's there to protect you as a creator, but it doesn't protect your idea. It, it protects the expression of your idea. So the work for hire agreement should carve out what or who owns what in terms of that expression um, and rights, derivative uh, rights to, to that same expression. And you, you want to think about the strategy of of what you're doing in terms of that situation, whether you want to own all of the derivative rights, but you will sort of uh, transfer your ownership interest to the party hiring you for this specific use, right? Like if you're like, oh, I got plenty of other good ideas. You take that one. I want to be compensated for it, but I also want to own all the derivative rights, right? So um, sometimes it's a layered approach in terms of what like it's not the short play, but the long play that you want to think about, but you want to think about that at the time that you start the engagement. And Lewis, I'm sure you probably have some recent examples, so I'm going to let you finish that one. But that's my no, um, you're, you're absolutely right. There's, um, you know, the, the beauty of copyrights is that you get protection the minute you create that original, um, that original work of art or expression. And so unlike a patent where you have to go through the process of filing an application and it being examined, as soon as you take that picture, as soon as you write that song, uh, as soon as you, you know, paint that painting, you have copyright protection that protects you from others using that original work of art or expression. Now, obviously filing with the copyright office gives you the ability to go after damages if there's infringement, but you know, you are entitled to the work that you've created. And so a work for hire document clearly defines who owns the resulting work product. And so if you hire a photographer to take your picture for, the, you know, for, you know, your, your website, technically that photographer owns the picture until you have paid them uh, and transfers ownership over to you as part of the work for hire documents. Okay, and we have a question here. Um, how is a design patent different from a trademark? Mm, very good question. I'll cover this in my class. Um, in some ways, not very much. Um, but here are some critical differences. Design patents expire. So design patents and design rights exist for 14 years. Trademarks do not expire as long as there is use in commerce or an intent to use in commerce or some connection between that brand, that logo and a product in commerce. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not abandoned intentionally or you don't let other people sort of trample upon your trademark rights such that it's diluted to the point that we can't distinguish you from someone else. So sometimes you'll see people um, say Kleenex brand tissue <laughs> rather than give me a Kleenex. Um, many years ago, there's a really useful um, uh, video from the people at Xerox because it's Xerox copies, not let me get a Xerox, right? So there are lots of ways that brands try to protect their brand from going generic. Um, but other than genericide, the trademark rights can exist forever, but that design right is fixed in time to that 14 year window. So that's really the big difference. And then trademarks um, are bigger than design rights in, in some sense, in terms of you create goodwill in the marketplace, you can capture more value for a trademark than you can for a design patent. Granted, you know, I say that and then I think of Apple v. Samsung, right, in the billions and billions of dollars that Apple has um, captured for that. 
but not many, you've never, you didn't hear about design patents before Apple v. Samsung, right? There's lots of design patents out here. Um, so the design rights became sort of cool and trendy um, through Apple, but trademark rights have existed for, for centuries. And I think there's a slight value edge on a trademark side than on the design patent side. Yeah, and I would add that um, trademark protection for products is, is really expanded over the last number of years. Um, a lot of times you hear it referred to as trade dress protection. Um, so not only you know, is the shape of a packaging you know, protectable through a trademark, but also the color. So when you think about insulation and the color pink, Owens Corning has trade dress protection where no other insulation manufacturer can make pink colored insulation. Uh, there, there's no other delivery vehicles that are brown uh, and the distinctive smell at Cinnabon you know, is, is protected under trade dress. So you can, you can protect the brand through color, through smell, through sound, uh, through shape. And, and really when we think about the, why does trade dress or trademarks exist, it's to prevent consumer confusion. It's to prevent, you know, a trademark is, is intended to identify the maker or, or seller of a product or a service. And if every delivery vehicle was brown or every brand of insulation was pink, it would be deceiving to the consumer as to which one is the brand that they thought they were buying. So, you know, I, I think, again, it's not either or, uh, trademark and design patents can be used in conjunction to build a very strong, cohesive intellectual property strategy. Great, those are really awesome examples. Um, Stephanie, I'm going to let you unmute Tanaka and see if we have a question or... Um, yes, we have a question from uh, one of our guests from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Tanaga Boozer. So Tanaga, I saw your hand was raised. So we've tried to unmute you here. Let's. Uh, I'm so like sorry, Stephanie. I do not have a question. That was act an accident. I'm actually trying to assist a student um, that wants to ask a question. So I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Uh, if you give me that student's name, I will unmute that student. Okay, Stephanie, that is Kylie. Kylie is from Tallahassee, Florida. He is a high school junior. Okay, let me see if I can do that. Welcome, Kylie. That's super impressive. I will tell you, when I was a high school junior, there's no way I would be on this asking questions about IP. <laughs> Kylie Gardner, is that you? Um, it's Kyle. She mispronounced my name, but it's cool. <laughs> All right. We're so glad to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. This is yes, awesome. Yes, ma'am. It's really appreciated. Thank you. What's your question? Okay. Oh, okay. My question is, um, well, I've sent it to the chat. I was just saying I have my own patent, like my own um, invention idea, and I was trying to see what my next steps would be so I could get a patent who I would talk to and just to see what I could do to be successful. Love it. I love it. So Tallahassee, um, are there any law schools near you? I would start with your local law schools to see if there's an IP clinic or if they're aware of resources for students. I'm about to um, write this down. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so like if you were in Atlanta, mm -hmm. I would like connect you with some people that could totally help you, but I could still help you. Mm. Um, Florida, oh, thank Florida you. Are not that far. Um, we, we could start with the local um, colleges and, and, and particularly the law schools to see who might be available and who, um, who they might uh, refer you to as far as resources. We talked about the pro bono patent program for the patent office. Um, again, that's another great resource for Florida and I'm pretty sure you guys have your own pro bono group. Um, and I don't know if anyone is on this chat, but write this down, K through 12 in venture. Um, there's some okay. competitions where if you compete, part of the prize would be for them to file a patent application for you. So oh, wow. there are lots of student resources. Students today have so many more resources than um, were ever known before. Maybe I was just not a smart enough student to know what was happening <laughs> on the resource level, but 
there are lots of resources for you. So um, I will make sure that, I mean, most of the folks who've organized this event actually are aware of the same resources I am. So, but we'll make sure as a follow-up, we can get you guys, here's where to go next. You but said I'm, K through 12 and Venture Mem. What did you say? It was K through 12 something? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. K through 12 in Venture Prize. Okay, got you. And what all are the requirements of this? So if I try to compete. We'll um, send you some info if you want to yeah. email. Oh, definitely. Yes, ma'am. Uh, S couch, like you sit on S couch at MIT.edu. Mm -hmm. We'll send you some info. We have uh, our colleagues from the National Academy of Inventors, NAI, uh, based in Florida, so they may be able to help too. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sure. And awesome. I have to give a shout out for young inventors um, in K 12. There's also the Microsoft Make What's Next program. Okay. Where they have some pro bono support, but they're really working on the gender gap in patenting. So mm -hmm. uh, there would need to be um, uh, representation of young women in a team-based format for us to, to connect. Is it okay if I give you my email so you can send me everything that you're talking about, if that's okay? Yeah, just Here, email. I'm gonna put my email in the chat, so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, that's great. and. Um, as a follow-up, we're gonna be sending all of these direct links um, in our follow-up email to everyone. So we'll have a collection of resources. Um, and so, yeah, keep um, sharing them in the chat as well, everyone who's on the line, if you have others that you'd like to recommend. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move us to a trademark question. Do I trademark my business name and logo together? And just generally, should I protect my business name and how? Yeah, so uh, my recommendation is to do both, right? So trademark the name, the word mark, and then trademark the logo, and then trademark the two of them together. Um, that gives you the most protection. And so you can trademark a name, a phrase, a symbol, a logo, um, and then obviously all the trade dress protection that we talked about as well. But the most powerful is the word mark. Like if you can get the word Microsoft or McDonald's or Nike as a word mark without the logo, then obviously it's gonna be even more protection uh, when you have it with the logo as well. Sometimes you're only able to get a mark if it's with the logo or with a phrase that goes along with it. Um, so shoot for being able to get just the word mark and that's going to give you the maximum amount of protection and then you can add on other ways of protecting it as well i don't have anything to add that was great i'm sorry <laughs> i can only figure out how to keep my video from freezing that's uh, that's the real challenge all right, I have a question about student competitions. Um, there are many science competitions for our students and entrepreneurship competitions, um, business plan competitions. I'll, I'll add along with that. Um, how does IP work with students' ideas submitted to these competitions? That's a great question. So the devil's in the details. Um, usually the competition will have some release and waiver form, um, some uh, competition rules, um, I'm trying to think how they also present between the rules of the competition and a release and waiver. You want to read all of that. Like, even if, you know, I know if you're like, I can't, I, I was on a, another Zoom earlier this summer and someone said, I can't read it, the terms and the agreements. It's like a foreign language. Just read one paragraph an hour, right? Like you can do one clause at a time. Like, let's just break it down. Everyone in this Zoom tonight can read. It's not that hard, but that's where all of your rights and obligations and ownership, you will sign it away if it's not clearly delineated who owns what after you disclose it. Um, one of the things we talked about first to file and patents and public disclosures will ruin your novelty. Like you will forever waive your right to file a patent application if you disclose it publicly. So you may want to figure out um, I'm going to file a patent on parts B, C, and D, so I'm only going to talk about part A, right? That's in the public domain. That's okay. All of the other stuff that I feel is 
um, really what is the nugget of my invention. I'm going to keep secret until I, I file the patent. But the disclosure of who owns what will be in the rules and the release and waivers. And I would just strongly encourage people to read all that before they say yes. Yeah, that's uh, that's great advice from Nicole. And let me let me add another situation that you got to be aware of as well. So obviously, you know, you having a provisional application would give you protection before you actually disclose, and that would not destroy the novelty of the invention. But the other thing is, is that there's always the chance that someone becomes a co-inventor in your invention based on their feedback. So you've presented to a panel of judges, and Nicole and I come up with some additions to your product. We make suggestions on ways to make it more novel, more unique, and we've just become inventors and therefore need to be listed on your patents because we have contributed to the, to the novelty of the invention. Um, ideally, what you want is uh, for, uh, for the judges, for anyone to assign over any intellectual property rights uh, for that or you don't incorporate those features that we include because otherwise by law, you would have to list us as co-inventors. And guess what, Nicole and I each would own 100% of the resulting patents along with you, which could be a really messy situation, especially if we each wanted to license it and you wanted to build a company around it. So intellectual property is a really, it's a tricky cis situation and you wanna make sure that you read everything about the event that you're going to. Uh, make sure you understand what legal rights you have and what legal rights you may give up because once it happens, it's really hard to undo it. Great, on the subject of licensing, we have a question here. Can you speak to licensing an idea whether or not you have patented it? Oh yeah, there are trade secret licenses all the time, right? So you can, completely license a concept. You can license anything. I can license this pen. If you're willing to pay me some money for my pen, happy to license it to you. Um, so it's just a matter of um, uh, the scope of the license, right? So is it an exclusive license? Is it a, um, um, is it for rights in terms of a, a two year, three year, four year, um, when does it terminate? How does it terminate? Um, do they own rights to derivative sort of um, ideas off of that concept or is it just specifically this concept? Um, so it gets complicated pretty quickly, but yes, in terms of um, generally, can you license the concept? Yes. Yeah, you know, a great example of one of those really long licenses is Listerine. So the inventor of Listerine never filed a patent because of course, as, as Nicole mentioned, he would have had to have given the formulation of how to make it. Instead, he treated it as a trade secret and he's been, or the, the family of the inventor has been receiving royalties on that formulation for over 70 years. Whereas if you just, li if you just licensed a patent, typically the license will end after the patent ends because then everyone in the world you know, is able to make that product without infringement. So she's, she's absolutely right. You can license really anything, but the advantage of having intellectual property is it creates value to that property right that you're licensing. Not everyone can just jump in and do it themselves. All right, can you discuss licensing versus opening a company around the invention and um, maybe walk us through a traditional licensing process? Yeah, you know, it really comes down to risk and reward, right? So licensing is less risky because you're not assuming manufacturing costs, inventory, building a company around the invention. Um, but the reward is less. You're typically receiving a royalty on sales and it can be in the consumer product space, two to 7% of sales. On the flip side, starting your own company is much riskier but the rewards are greater because not only are you generating gross profits off of the sale of the product, but you're creating a company that ultimately could be sold for a significant amount of money if the company is profitable. Not every inventor wants to be an entrepreneur and not every entrepreneur is capable of being an inventor. 
Those are two very unique skills. But when you have both of them present together, you've got the right ingredient for someone to create something novel and actually build a business around it. Great, thank you. We have a few questions around public disclosure, and I think this is also a really important concept um, for our audience here. So I'm gonna give you a few of these. Do you still have a year um, from public disclosure to file for a patent? Is that um, still applicable? And can you speak a bit more about public disclosure? What counts as disclosed? If you gave it to a friend to desk, is that public disclosure? Um, so your thoughts. Yeah, so, um... The, to get at the first point in terms of the timing. So yes, the clock starts um, a year from your public disclosure that you have to file. Um, generally speaking, the patent law works as a protection of the inventor that you can't do prior art to yourself. That's sort of this concept in terms of what gives you that um, one year time frame. Now, who and what satisfies the public disclosure. The law specifically says that if it's available anywhere in the world, right? So that's what the language of the statute means. So if I go across the street and I'm in my neighbor's garage talking about my really cool device, that's my public disclosure. Um, now, in terms of how that would play out, you know, if you showed it at the, in, you know, in school in front of your locker, um, to your friend, would your friend, you know, argue that um, you publicly disclosed the invention to me? Um, maybe, hopefully not. At least it's a sign of your friendship that's gone sour. Um, but second, and more importantly, maybe what you showed that day when you're ready to file the patent application, you got something totally different. Like you're, you continue to work on it. You, you refined it. You you realize your prototype um, was missing something. So you may have a public disclosure, but you wanna make sure if you're worried about that coming back to haunt you, that when you actually file the patent application, you add some additional value. So if the claim gets knocked out based on that public disclosure, you have other claims to rely on, other features in the application to rely on. So you're not just taking feature A and filing feature A, but you've got now B, C, D, E, F, G, and how they all work, and, and they've got some new um, new discoveries and, and new value that you can get out of the patent. Excellent advice. <laughs> Public disclosure right. tends to be a popular issue. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're coming to the end of our time. I'm gonna take a couple of more questions, but I just wanna acknowledge that we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. So um, just, we will do our best to follow up with you after the session and see if we can get some answers to those we weren't um, able to get to, unfortunately. But thanks everyone again for joining us. Um, and we will announce our raffle winners in a few moments, but um, first let's, let's get one or two last questions. I have one here for makerspaces, innovation centers, and innovation challenges. Um, can you make faculty, mentors, judges, and others that are engaging with students sign a blanket waiver um, that protects students from having to include these people as co-creators? So I'll start, and you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but for the most part, folks who are helping you should be assisting, and they shouldn't be trying to sort of compete with you and claim an ownership value. So any student I've helped, and I've helped numerous over the years, it would never dawn on me. Like I've added much value to people's filings. Like, ah, have you thought about this? And they're like, oh my God, professor. Like I, but I don't want to compete with you, right? So um, generally speaking, so this is like a super generalization, which means it's probably false. The answer is no, faculty and folks who are at makerspaces um, are not inventors, right? So one of the other things that I'll say, my nerdy patent attorney brain, takes two concepts to be an inventor. You have to have the conception. So you conceived of the solution. And then there's a second step called reduction of practice. So that's you built a prototype, um, you filed the patent application and you put all the steps in the application, but you need both. So someone who just helps you build a prototype 
is not the inventor, right? If you gave it to your lab tech and said, here, do all these steps, and that person does all the steps and that's it, they're not an inventor. So the inventor is someone who has the conception and the reduction of practice. So um, lots of places where students and others can kind of go build and, and be creative. Um, and usually the folks who are helping them set up and do all that are not inventors. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, I, I don't think most educators are looking to take away intellectual property rights of their students. Uh, but one, one good practice, of course, when you're working with outside service providers is to have a confidentiality agreement. And that confidentiality agreement should address both intellectual property and derivative intellectual property. So it should address that any improvements um, that are suggested or made are the ownership of you, the inventor, uh, and any derivative IP. So any other uses of the intellectual property should also be assigned over to you. And so if you're hiring someone to do the work, it's a work for hire situation. So you're hiring a graphic designer or an industrial designer or a machinist to build a prototype for you. That's somewhat cut and dry from work for hire. But when you're showing it to you know, potential uh, advisors, a confidentiality agreement typically addresses that situation. It limits disclosure and it also addresses upfront before you've even shared the invention, who owns it. And so it, it defines the rules before there's engagement. Okay, last but not least, um, what are good things to read or watch on how to start to trademark your business? Well, I'll give a plug to the patent office. They actually have on their trademark um, menu on the website, they have videos that will help you um, and walk you through how to file a trademark application. Um, INTA, the International Trademark Association, I forget what the N stands for, um, has some really helpful resources on their website in terms of how to think about brand protection and what that means and what you want to include in your trademark filing. Hmm, I don't have anything else off the top of my head. I don't know, if Lewis, if you've got some. Yeah, no, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Michelson IP because the collection of videos that they've created to address all forms of intellectual property not just patents, but trademarks and copyrights as well, are, are just really exceptional. And I've been able to use these videos for you know, middle school classes. I use them for my college students. I even make my grad students uh, for a class that I teach on intellectual property for entrepreneurs watch these videos because it just very succinctly defines what these property rights are when you use them and it just makes it easy to understand. It's, it's kind of the schoolhouse rocks for IP. Delani, I hope you don't mind. But I'm going to uh, unmute uh, Joyce Ward of the USPTO. Uh, we work very closely with Joyce Ward. Hopefully she's um, not stepped away because we'd, I'd love to hear uh, any words of wisdom you might add to this conversation, Joyce, and uh, any um, closing remarks you might want to make because you've, you've done so much work in this space for the education community. Hi, Joyce. She might need to- unmute. Possible you're on mute, Joyce. Um, so we'll give you a moment. Um, in the okay. Meantime, How about now? We can hear you. Okay. Okay. Yes, you all took me off guard there. Um, <laughs> hi. Good evening. I mean, thank you so much for host for um, conducting this program. I found it extremely informative, and it's just such um, so encouraging and inspiring to see people talking about intellectual property and answering questions. Um, for students and for attendees uh, to the program. So um, I don't have anything to add other than to say um, what a wonderful collaboration and we're super excited and stand ready and willing and happy to support in whatever way we can. And, and I do want to say thank you for all the shout outs to USPTO and to the, the resources that are out there. So thank you, Nicole and Lewis and 
uh, Stephanie and Jelani, again, um, great work, and this was very informative. Thanks for including us. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Joyce. Um, okay. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So very quickly, our raffle winners are um, for the first gift card is Quanda Graves. Uh, the oh. second will be Diane Sabato. And the third and final gift card winner is Carmen Diaz. Um, so congrats to our, our winners, our random uh, raffle generator chose these names. So um, yeah, really excited that you all joined us until the end here. And um, we will send a follow-up email so you can claim those um, after we follow up with you tomorrow. Uh, so just want to close this out by thanking our speakers, Nicole Morris and Lewis Foreman. This was an awesome session. Um, yeah, ask, ask me anything about IP. Um, really appreciate your just wisdom and insight and advice. And hopefully, um, Stephanie, I don't know what you think. Hopefully we can do this again sometime. Oh, yeah. This, let's do it again. And thank you. I, I just really appreciate the time, everyone. I just want to I just want to add something real quick, Jelani. Uh, first off, my apologies for for why my video keeps freezing. I have no idea since I've been on Zoom calls every day since March. Um, but the other thing is is that the ask me anything doesn't have to end right now. And so I put my email address in the chat room. Anytime you have a question about entrepreneurship or intellectual property, feel free to reach out. I, I respond to every single email that I get. And so you, you may not have wanted to ask a question this evening. You may not even think of the question until next week or next month or next year. Uh, but if you reach out to me, I promise I'll get back to you. Yes, likewise. Um, Lewis, you are fantastic. So I might even reach out to you because you, you had some great <laughs> advice. I'm definitely going to we'll bring you in as a guest you're well represented this evening, right? <laughs> Absolutely. This is fantastic. Thanks right. for joining us, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. We really appreciate that. All right. Take care. Thank you, everyone. All right. Happy Thanksgiving in advance. Be safe.